YouTube channel, Daniel Rosell Jerusalem and Israel Unpacked <coughs> is the full name of this YouTube channel. My name is Daniel Rosell, bringing you this video today from Jerusalem. And I uh, just want to say quickly, as I said in my last video, which went up yesterday, shifting direction slightly on this YouTube channel. I've been doing a lot of vids recently about Ireland and Israel, their reaction to what's going on here and trying to highlight some uh, extremist discourse. And as I said yesterday, uh, if I'm doing that activity at all, I'm going to push it off to a separate YouTube channel. So let's get back to uh, talking about Jerusalem and Israel and trying to dive a little bit deeper than what's on the news headlines. That is my uh, mission here. So today I want to uh, showcase um, some interesting uh, research carried out by uh, that was horrible. Uh, this is a real difficult one to pronounce in Hebrew. It's the Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research. And uh, they put out these kind of yearly statistical fact books that contain really a ton of really interesting information um, about the uh, climate in Jerusalem. So I'm going to just kind of go through that. But first, I thought I would just uh, set the scene a little bit by talking about who these people are. It's the Jerusalem Institute for Policy Research. Um, they were established in 1979 and it's a leading and uh, influential uh, research and thought institute that issues from Jerusalem a sustainable social, economic and spatial doctrine. Uh, the institute is where is where reality shapers turn to, I'm just going to bring up this text a little bit, in order to promote and define policy issues in Israel and in Jerusalem in particular. Uh, the issue, The institute's mission, so basically I would call this a think tank, maybe a slightly more progressive leaning think tank. The Institute's mission is to influence policy design, decision making processes, planning processes and strategy. And the primary target audience that the Institute's work with to realize this mission are decision and policy makers on the local and national level, civil society organizations, the private sector and the general public that is interested in urban planning, public policy and human geography. The Institute produces in-depth and form products that enable these audience to form their positions and activities in a rational manner based on understanding broad context and implications. Uh, very, very nice uh, information about them. So this is the latest um, edition of their Facts and Trends yearbook in English. It's a 34 page PDF and I'm just going to be going through uh, a little bit of its, uh, its insights in order to, as I said, pluck them out. Uh, so you can see the people here on the board of directors led by its uh, director general, Dr. David Corin, who many years ago I actually did an internship at the mayor's office uh, during the mayorship of, uh, of Nir Barkat in Jerusalem before he went into national politics. And uh, Dr. David Corrin, uh, I believe I actually shared an office with him for that summer. And he, is, uh, he was at the time the, uh, uh, the strategic advisor on Arabic affairs to the Jerusalem municipality under the Barkat uh, mayorship. And uh, now he's doing this. So this is called Jerusalem Facts and Trends 2023, the state of the city and changing trends. Um, just in terms of biases, I do want to just point out something uh, that this uh, the publication was made possible possible through the general generous support of our partners, and those familiar with Israel will recognize the Jerusalem municipalities uh, logo up there. Um, so there is they if you know I would say as a sort of former uh, journalist, uh, you always have to look at the money flows when you're trying to obsess objectivity and the Jerusalem municipality has funded the publication of this so to the extent that you'd hope that they'd be critical of the municipality's policy I would say that's not ideal uh, but it's good that they at least disclose that uh, that in the area so this is in 2021 the Jerusalem divided according to its main neighborhoods and population groups and as you know I've remarked commonly Jerusalem is an extremely complicated city and I think it's actually easier to think of Jerusalem as three cities, like the ones they have. They call this general Jewish, and what they mean by that is kind of uh, not Haredi Jewish. Haredi, for those not familiar, is ultra-Orthodox. Arab, uh, or East Jerusalem, or Palestinian Jerusalem, is, uh, is in uh, orange highlight. And uh, they have here non-residential area or missing data, uh, including some, I would say, are... Like Har Chutzvim, for instance, is really, uh, this is the one here in the center. 
Harcourt's Veeam is really kind of just an industrial estate. Uh, so that's probably why it's thus, cla thus classified. Givat Ram, again, is not really residential. That's why it's not uh, classified. It is a, a Hebrew University campus and sort of other stuff like that. Um, so this is just anyway an interesting way of looking at Jerusalem. And of course, as they point out, there is Bethlehem to the south and there is Ramallah to the north and to the east is uh, Malaya Dumim and to the west are the Jerusalem hills. So the old city here is the core and in Arab East Jerusalem, as you can see, isn't just East Jerusalem, Beit Hanina, Atarot, Kafar Akab. Just a quick remark on Kafar Akab, it's, it's really over the separation fence uh, that Israel built. Nevertheless, it's technically within the Jerusalem municipality boundaries. So that creates, that makes it very problematic. It's kind of a cesspool of, uh, of drugs and crime and whatnot. Um, because the PA can't go in and Israel can't really go in either because of its own security barrier. So East Jerusalem is the east of Jerusalem, but Beit Safafa is also technically part of Arab Jerusalem, even though it's really in the south. Uh, so that's just important to point out. And the neighborhoods that are considered not ultra-Orthodox or what they call general Jewish, Talpiot, Arnona, Gilo, Harchoma, Irganim, in Kerem, Rechavia, Nachlaot. Um, and then this isn't really perfect because the city center classifying that as ultra, ultra Orthodox Haredi, I would take issue with that. But certainly uh, Romema, Geola. So the kind of ultra Orthodox part of Jerusalem, if you will, the Haredi part of Jerusalem, is kind of this part to the north of the city center, stretching up to Ramot alone. Uh, and I would say that's overall pretty accurate. So I'm going to try focus mostly on um, just kind of the, the latest stuff and not stuff that has remained uh, the case for time memorial or, you know, as of 2021, Jerusalem's uh, jurisdictional territory is 126 square kilometers. Uh, by way of comparison, Tel Aviv is 54. So Jerusalem is actually more than double the size of Tel Aviv uh, and is Israel's most populous city. But again, take that chart we looked at previously and chop this into three cities with East Jerusalem, regular Jerusalem, and Haredi Jerusalem, and I think I think that's a more accurate uh, representation. Uh, the climate in 2022, nothing really extraordinarily, extraordinarily interesting here. It was kind of the same. Now we get to the much more juicy stuff, the population information. So we can see here uh, the Arab and Jewish population in Jerusalem, trend lines between... Uh, 1967 and 2021 um, and what we actually see is that the Jewish population in Jerusalem as a percentage of the city population has been in steady decline it was 74 percent Jewish in 1967 and in 2021 it got down to 61 percent uh, so the Arab sector in Jerusalem is actually growing total fertility rate in Jerusalem um, over the last kind of couple of decades uh, Arab fertility has been shrinking a bit and Jewish and other fertility has been expanding a bit. Uh, this is very interesting too. Sources of migration to and from Jerusalem. Uh, so this is based on, I had to look up the Hebrew uh, version because it stated it where it doesn't state here, 2021. In migration of 12,000 people to Jerusalem in that year, comprising among them 3,700 Olim Chadashim, 1,600 Israelis returning from abroad, and 800 who were uh, family reunification. But out migration, migrants from Jerusalem, 23,000 rounding up, uh, and people leaving to go to other countries was two. So the, uh, you know, basically we're talking about here, a net picture of out migration of about 6,000 people. So this has been reflecting a trend going on for years whereby Jerusalem is losing people. And why is Jerusalem losing people, especially young people? Lack of jobs. Um, and I would say mostly, I mean, you can see here, look at, look at the poverty rates as well. The extents of poverty in Jerusalem, in Israel and Jerusalem. So the Israel poverty rate for Jews is 16%, but in, in uh, Jerusalem it's 31%. The poverty rate of Arabs in Jerusalem is higher. The baseline is 40 nationwide. 
In Jerusalem at 60, so both Jews and Arabs are affected to poverty to a greater extent in Jerusalem uh, than in the rest of the of the country. So the population of Jerusalem uh, does continue to uh, to grow. In 2021, Jerusalem was um, had 590,000 Jews um, and 375,000 Arabs. So we're basically getting very close to the 1 million mark. I think we might have actually passed it since then. And there are 282,000 Haredim living in uh, Jerusalem, Haredim the ultra-Orthodox. So we can see the city is still, is still growing. So what do all these things tell us together? Well, um, the population of the city is growing despite the fact that current residents are actually leaving and those two contradictions can be explained by the birth rate being high uh, in Jerusalem. The fertility rate and the poverty rate is up there too. This is another interesting chart here uh, showing the population, how many Jews live in East Jerusalem and how many Arabs live in West Jerusalem. And we can see here uh, that the amount of Arabs is tiny. It's 5,000 living in West Jerusalem versus 354,000 uh, Jews living there. Uh, but in East Jerusalem, there are 237,000 Jews living there. And that would be predominantly in settlements like Malezetim, in other words, and the, the definition of East and West here goes according to the green line. Um, the average household size in 2022 among Jerusalem's Jewish pop stood at 3.3 persons, compared to as three as the national average. Uh, and the Arabs, uh, 4.7, almost five people per house, compared with four. So they have bigger households uh, than Jews in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's population is significantly younger than the population of Israel's major cities. In 2021, the median age of Jerusalem residents stood at just 24 years old, compared to 36, which is already quite young, among Tel Aviv, and 39 among Haifa. Among Israel's population at large, the median age was 30. So Jerusalem's median uh, population age is, uh, is about younger. But it's actually come up, coming mostly from the Arab sector. Jerusalem's Jewish population is older than its Arab population. We can see the age structure here of Jerusalem's populations split between, again, Jews and, uh, and Arabs. So we can see what kind of age groups are, uh, are living in the city here. And I would speculate that, that possibly part of this is that it's very common for new immigrants. I'm in my 30s, 34 to be precise. It's very common for new immigrants to kind of start their time in Israel, in Jerusalem, and for some Israelis to study in Jerusalem, and then really to move to Tel Aviv uh, as soon as you finish your education or you can leave your home just because the jobs are still in Tel Aviv and the Merkaz. The Merkaz is the center of Israel. Um, so I would say that's probably the reason we're seeing, right? People kind of the around 30 to 34, is, we're seeing it begin to really contract uh, that age pyramid there. So uh, religious identification. Jewish population 20 or older in Israel, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv and Haifa. So in Jerusalem, we have 35% um, ultra-Orthodox Haredim. That's the green highlight here. Compared to just 10% on average in Israel. And in Tel Aviv, 1%. So very few ultra-Orthodox in Tel Aviv. And just 4% in Haifa. So in uh, Tel Aviv, the biggest Jewish cohort is what are called loosely, traditionally, sorry, secular, non-religious. 70% in Tel Aviv versus only 20% in Jerusalem. Loosely traditional observant, 13% Jerusalem, 14% uh, Tel Aviv. And traditionally observant, which is uh, often, I think, Masorti, 12% Tel Aviv, 12% in Jerusalem. I'm probably in this, uh, that's probably my cohort, the traditionally observant. I'm certainly not ultra-religious. Uh, I don't, uh, I'm not, wouldn't qualify really as a Dati. That's religiously observant, 20% in Jerusalem. So I'm uh, in this 12% group. Uh, <clears throat> mortality. 74% in 2021 were Jewish death. And we can see the fertility rates. Again, I'm just really kind of skimming through this here. So migration to Jerusalem, as we, as we mentioned before, the total of 12,000 new residents moved to Jerusalem from other localities in, in Israel, or I think outside of Israel as well. This number was higher than the previous year's figure of 11,000, obviously not by a gigantic amount and a markedly high proportion of in migrants came from Judea and Samaria 12, 12, 2,800 residents so where these people are coming from Judea and Samaria the central district and Tel Aviv 
Migration from Jerusalem in 2021, a total of 23,000 residents migrated from Jerusalem to other localities in Israel. That was significantly higher than 2020. So these are, this is what I would kind of um, underline here as an important finding, right? That That's a jump of 4,000 year on year there from 2021, from 2020 to 2021. So uh, Jerusalem really needs to look at what it's doing in terms of, uh, of retaining people. A markedly high proportion of the out migrants left for localities in the Jerusalem district. So again, I would say when we're talking about Jerusalem district, we're also talking about a lot of the kind of um, kibbutzim and moshavim just outside of Jerusalem um, within commuting distance where people can just get much better value. And we're seeing in Jerusalem a huge surfeit of luxury development and extremely expensive housing. And these factors are pushing people, uh, people out of the city. The six lo- so where did they go? The six localities that drew the largest number of out migrants from Jerusalem were, unsurprisingly, I would say, Beit Shemesh in number one. Beit Shemesh is about 40 minutes, I'm going to say, outside of Jerusalem by car. A very nice place. Um, quite Anglo-centric, a lot of English speakers. And again, this is just reflective of people maybe working in Jerusalem but looking for cheaper accommodation. We see Tel Aviv. I'm surprised, actually, that Tel Aviv is relatively far down but we're still not talking about vast hordes of people here 1500 versus 3500 that would be for mostly employment and i would say also secular people tired of the what some people might perceive as religious coercion in jerusalem and then other people went to modin mevetzeret among the out migrants from jerusalem 35 percent were young people and young adults aged 15 to 29 and children 26 percent of those out migrants were aged uh, 30 to 64 and five were above 65 so basically once people are at that age they seem to stick in jerusalem but it's common to get out of jerusalem in your 20s and 30s um, and even earlier in uh, in israel let's go back to the report and this is all that plotted on uh, trends lines in 2021 so let's talk about aliyah immigration from other countries to israel in 2021, the number of immigrants who chose Jerusalem as their first place of residence in Israel was the highest among Israel's cities. So this report is full of, I would say, contradictions or things that are kind of hard to understand together, uh, which is why I'm going through it. So that's actually quite successful in terms. So the I would say the picture is one of failure in m- retaining the population at large, but they're actually having success in Aliyah. Uh, in 2021, 3,700 people came into Jerusalem. Uh, by comparison, 3,300 chose Tel Aviv and 2,000 chose Haifa. So not a vast number of immigrants, but still Jerusalem technically won. Uh, the immigrants who chose to live in Jerusalem accounted for 40, 14% of all immigrants to Israel. Among immigrants who chose Jerusalem as their first place of residence in Israel during that year, a notable proportion came from the US, 35%, France, 22%, Russia, 7%. Uh, and at the national level, by comparison, the main countries from which immigrants to Israel came were Russia at 30%, France and the US. So basically, Jerusalem remains a popular, uh, outsi- out, outsized, out proportionately popular choice among um, actually US and French immigrants. Um, and pe- folks from Ukraine uh, tend to be going more to other people, other places, I should say, in, uh, in Israel. And we can see the trends here between 2020 and 2021. Jerusalem's in green and, uh, you know, kind of going broadly up as well as Tel Aviv and Haifa. So as these are all kind of on the general increase, I guess we can determine that probably less and less people are choosing, you know, non the, the cities are, are the main cities of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv and Haifa are remaining as the kind of most popular choices among uh, among anger immigrants. Jerusalem is one of the poorest cities of Israel. 40% are in poverty, 39% of the families. Um, uh, And it's that significantly higher than Israel at large, where 21% of the families are in uh, in poverty. That's the highest among Israeli cities, was B'nai Barak in second place. Poverty is particularly prevalent among Haredim and Arab populations, which are characterized by large families. Among Jerusalem, now this is a really interesting stat. Among Jerusalem's Haredi population, 43% were living below the poverty line. That's almost one in two. That is huge. Um, a slightly higher figure than the poverty rate among Israel's Haredi population. And here's another stunning figure. Among 
Jerusalem's Arab population, 60% were living below the poverty line. So 40% of the ultra-Orthodox and 60% of the Haredi, those are shocking numbers. Um, and we can see here that just compared to Tel Aviv with 12%, Jerusalem is up there with B'nai Brak, also highly religious. And those are really on a kind of level of their own, uh, quite higher than even Ashdod at 21%. So poverty is a big problem in Jerusalem, big, big problem. Education in uh, 2021, 183,000 students were enrolled in, in Jerusalem's Hebrew education system. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. I find it less interesting personally. A metropolitan area consists of localities that maintain functional relations with one another, in particular with the principal city. The metropolitan localities are classified into rings. So the Jerusalem metropolitan area is the second largest metro area in Israel after Tel Aviv. Um, and in 2021, that had 1.4 million. So the city itself is just crawling up on one, and the metro area uh, go, gets us up to 1.4. The Jerusalem metro area is composed of the metro core, which is Jerusalem city, and an outer ring that comprises two sectors. Uh, the Jerusalem metropolitan area contained 80 residential localities with um, 966,000 residents, and the outer ring in 437,000 residents. So that is uh, interesting. So they divide the metro areas into the urban core and the outer ring and the inner ring uh, where those exist. Now let's take a look at employment rates in Jerusalem. So the partic participation rate among the main working ages, 25 to 64 in Jerusalem, 70% of men and, um, sorry, let's look at the Jewish sector on the left where we have 70 and 83. And really actually the group that stands out is significantly uh, unemployed is Arab women. Only 20% of Arab women aged 25 to 64 in Jerusalem are participating in the labor force versus 80% of men. So that speaks to something interesting, I think, about the Arab Jewish society. Uh, basically, in only one of every four families do we have uh, a dual income family where the woman's working as well. And in three quarters of families, uh, the male is the sole bread earner. Here is a curious one. Overnight stays by foreign tourists and Israelis at hotels in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv and Eilat. Uh, Eilat is much more popular, but Jerusalem and Tel Aviv are kind of equally popular. Both and these trends are, well, I was going to say for Jerusalem and Tel Aviv is kind of a similar picture for both. But for Eilat, much more popular among, uh, among Israelis with 97% of hotel stays uh, coming from domestic tourism. So there's 42,000 students enrolled at different uh, colleges in Jerusalem with 22,000 out of those at Hebrew U, 40,000 at the more vocationally oriented academic colleges and uh, 6,300 at teacher training colleges. Apartment sales in Jerusalem by apartment size. Uh, so interestingly, 2.5 to 3 bedroom apartments, or sorry, I should say room apartments are the most popular uh, and this is 2022 figures versus 2021 here. Um, so, you know, people living in sort of modest dwellings by and large in Jerusalem. 4.5 rooms or more large properties in the minority here. Labor force participation. In 2022, the labor force participation rate among Jerusalem residents of the main working age stood at 67%. Uh, and that, again, is including both Jews, Arabs, men, women. And we've seen where those discrepancies come from previously. Now, here is the labor force participation rate for Jerusalem residents aged 25 to 64. They're what they call the working age. Haredi, non-Haredi Jews and Arabs, okay? 81% of Arabs, 85% of non-Haredi Jews in, in, the, in the working group are working. Uh, only, however, 45% of Haredi men. That's a one big discrepancy. And again, a very major discrepancy in Arab women with 84% of uh, Jewish and 81% of Haredi women both working, but only 27% of, uh, of the Arab women. Again, that, that strikes to me as the demographic that is uh, sort of uh, voluntarily staying out of the workforce. So for 345, 900 employed people were working in Jerusalem, 8% of the all the employment in Israel. And where do people work? What kind of jobs do people work in Jerusalem? Next question. Now we see 
women and men is uh is uh is is green and blue and education professional services trades accommodation transportation construction now what we're seeing very noticeably right is i would say a, a, a surface of an education would include jewish education so women are as you can see um sort of disproportionately involved in working in the education sector and working in human health services in israel but the percentage of high tech in israel is is pretty pitiful uh, for women, it's less than 5%. And for men, it kind of looks like about 7% to me working in the lucratively paid high tech. Now, we, they don't show this for Tel Aviv. I'd be very interested to see a comparison. I'd imagine we'd see a very different picture. Uh, higher education, um, according to university students by degree, uh, Hebrew U is kind of the second one in the city there after Tel Aviv U. So you can kind of get start to get a bit of a sense more for the kind of relatively poor economic performance of Jerusalem, right? Quite a few students and most people who are working are working. And I would say by and large, lowly compensated jobs or lower compensated jobs. Uh, this is the high tech industry is the or where the well-paid jobs in Israel are. And we're seeing less, you know, that figure hovering around 5%. So that is just one area where Jerusalem really, really needs more jobs. Um, these tourism jobs exist in high numbers. In 2022, Jerusalem had 86 tourist hotels with a room stock of 11,000 guest rooms. And that's bringing some money into the city. Foreign tourists have been um, uh, doing more, uh, you know, as you'd expect, some domestic tourism as well, and a bit of a dip there in, I believe that's the corona year when foreign tourists were uh, basically not allowed into Israel. So that's why in that particular uh, point in time, we see that gap. Housing and construction, 243,200 residential apartments and 2022 construction was completed. Average price for privately owned 3.5 to four room apartments in Israel, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv and Haifa, right? The trend is going up across the board. But the trend in Jerusalem is going up surprisingly uh, somewhere between that of Tel Aviv and uh, the national trend. So both we're seeing both uh, Jerusalem here in green and Tel Aviv here in purple are, uh, you know, uh, exceeding the national trend. And the national trend line is orange there. So only half of the major cities is below it. So uh, Jerusalem is just too expensive. And again, I think that's reflected in the out migration we're seeing to those com commuter towns that's my run through of the 2023 jerusalem yearbook i know that was kind of a rapid fire uh run through but i think some really interesting stats to be gleaned out of that and i look forward to doing this video again uh when the next policy books come out from the jipr i encourage people to check out the research of the jerusalem uh, institute for policy research at jerusalem institute.org.il thanks for watching guys until the next video